Built at over 13,000 feet above sea level, shortly after the city's founding, its population would surpass London, Rome, Milan, and Sevilla. Over the course of a century, 60% of the Earth's silver would be mined from one mountain near this city. To get an idea of what this city was like, think the violent street battles of gangs of New York. But amp it up a little bit. Where nearly everyone is high on cocaine. A lot of cocaine. And many are suffering from the paranoid, anger-inducing effects of mercury poisoning. This high-altitude, absurd carnival of death and decadence was called Potosi. This story begins when a prospector, with the help of the local Indians, stumbled across a massive vein of silver that had been exposed by the fierce cutting winds high in the Andean mountains. The Spaniards had quickly expended the massive golden windfall from the sacked Inca and Aztec empires. And as a few still searched in vain for the mythical golden city of El Dorado, a very real city of silver would quickly take shape in the Spanish viceroyalty of Peru. Seemingly overnight, a massive labyrinth-like metropolis began to take chaotic shape. Twisting narrow alleys offered a small respite from the never-ending bone-piercing wind. This chaotic mismatch of extravagant villas and modest huts, peppered by gambling houses, theaters, churches, workshops, warehouses, and whorehouses, attracted mercenary sword and pistol for hire, artists, academics, priests, prostitutes, laborers, and traders from Spain and beyond, enticed by the tales of seemingly unlimited wealth pouring out from the earth. I am Rich Potosi, treasure of the world, king of all mountains, and envy of kings, read the city's coat of arms. During the extraction of the massive initial silver vein found at Potosi, Spanish refiners could not manage to get their furnaces hot enough to separate the silver from the rock. But the Indians, whose small hilltop ovens harnessed the wind in their favor, were able to get the job done, setting up dozens and then hundreds of small ovens that were able to carry Potosi through the first 20 years. It was said these fires glowed on the mountaintops like fireflies around the city. And then, by the mid-1560s, nearly all the exposed silver on the surface of the mountain had been mined and production was steadily slowing. The Spanish king was obviously very concerned over the slowdown in production, as the empire began to increasingly rely on the steady flow of silver from Potosi to pay for Spain's vast armies and armadas. A trusted acolyte of the king was sent across the Atlantic to solve the problem of the shrinking shipments of silver. After months of traveling, he arrived in Potosi. He thought the city was a dump. He would get to that later. First, the silver production needed to increase. Because the exposed surface silver had been mined, ever deeper mine shafts and larger labor forces became necessary. He exploited an old Inca practice of paying taxes by providing a tribute of one year of labor out of eight. He organized all the local tribes in the area to pay their tithe of a fixed number of men, 18 to 50 years old. Temperature and humidity differences between the depths of the mine and the surface meant pneumonia and respiratory infections were rife, with one mining boss noting, if 20 healthy Indians enter on Monday, half may emerge cripple on Saturday. A demographic collapse in the surrounding countryside caused by the burden of this labor tax that all too often meant a death sentence, earned the mountain the nickname Quechua, meaning the mountain that eats men. This labor force was further supplemented by a large number of African slaves. However, they were not accustomed to the harsh cold and high altitudes, and nearly every consignment of slaves would completely succumb to death. Regarding the problem of smelting of the silver, in an efficient manner. He had a solution for that too. He brought over a process that had just been invented in Mexico a few years prior, but he would implement it on a massive scale. Finely crushed silver ore would be mixed with salt, water, copper sulfate, and then dumped into a pool of mercury, thoroughly mixed by horses and men, and presto. Near pure lumps of silver could be sifted out from the sludge and minted in a coin for which a mint was established and turned out millions of silver coins. These coins, ocho reales, the iconic pirate pieces of eight, were so widely circulated 
that these would have been the majority of the coins in the pockets of America's founding fathers, and was legal tender in the United States until 1857. Toxic mercury workhouses and massive dams powering a plethora of stamping mill facilities were built all over the city. When one of the dams burst, severely damaging a large portion of the city, Toledo turned this crisis into an opportunity to rebuild this chaotic city on an orderly Spanish grid pattern, with a large beautiful plaza at the center and long straight broad avenues. Although much more aesthetically pleasing, these straight broad open corridors were perfect for the icy Andean wind to shoot down. After 11 years on the job, and a massive overhaul of pretty much everything, not only in Potosi, but the entire vice royalty of Peru, the king's man took a moment to bask in his achievement. He then received a summons to return to Spain, where he was tried on corruption charges and incarcerated. He died shortly afterwards, under abysmal conditions. Potosi continued to expand after his death, fueled by an allure of an apparent infinite tide of wealth. There was a pitiful attempt to control the flood of newcomers to the city. However, with forgers, bribes, and corruption, incompetence, newcomers couldn't be stopped. Many men joined the crews of merchant ships, with the intention of making it to Potosi. One trader commented, In every port where merchant vessels put down anchor, they jump ship and leave behind their duties and obligations, absenting themselves in anticipation of the liberties and uncertain riches of Potosi. Upon arrival, on top of having to deal with the freezing temperatures and cutting wind, our newly arrived adventurer had to breathe air that was thick with soot from many thousands of charcoal lit fires that burned 24-7 in every part of the city. Carbon monoxide poisoning increased the difficulty of breathing at such high altitudes, and for a sizable percent of the city's Spanish population that was involved in the myriad of jobs surrounding the handling of massive amounts of mercury on a daily basis, irritability, lack of self-control, insomnia, tremors, fits of anger, and violent irrational behavior are a few of the symptoms of mercury poisoning that they would have to deal with. A solution was found in a local plant, first decried as witchcraft and sorcery by the local clergy. The coca leaves that the Indians chewed on at high altitudes, giving them increased stamina, was a welcome respite from all the less than comfortable side effects that Potosi had to offer. The clergy quickly changed their minds, hailing the plant as a wonder cure. The priests would make a powdered form of the plant that rapidly became very popular, especially in Potosi. For those who were made of tough enough stuff to survive a few years in Potosi, there were fortunes to be made. Those who could save or steal enough to buy a mill, a workshop, or a mine shaft, and then another and another with the profits, accumulated immense fortunes in a short period of time. An author of the time noted that the city's residents nurtured such elevated thoughts, exemplified by mining boss Domingo Beltran who reportedly proclaimed himself to be among the world's most important figures. The Pope in Rome, the King of Spain, and Domingo Beltran in Potosi. However, many of these fortunes would be as short-lived as the city's average life expectancy. Like everyone else in the city, the mind owners found innumerable reasons to hate each other, and this led to constant violence. First, small groups of bodyguards and hired swords would be brought on to protect the mine shafts and palatial villas. Then, a rival would hire more men, and back and forth it went. These gangs evolved into two main factions, those controlled by the Basques from northern Spain and everyone else. Heavily armed and finely clothed, ruffians would amass in the city's plaza. The scene was surreal. Every year or two, this city of over 150,000 souls at 13,500 feet above sea level, would stage battles between gangs dressed in finery. Oxygen-starved horses dropped dead where they stood. In a few cases, thousands would die in these exchanges. This chaotic world, high on its own wealth, megalomania, altitude, and cocaine, would not last forever. By 1700, all the easily accessible and larger veins of silver had all been mined, and production was lower than a third of what had been at its height. The population had fallen to only about 60,000 as the factories and workshops ran silent and work could not be found. The insane wealth, violence, and spectacle of Potosi had faded into legend and eventually obscurity. But the city's silver had changed the world forever, facilitating the exchange of slaves, fabric, spices, and other goods across the globe. Much discussed in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, Potosi 
helped fund the Spanish Empire's wars with the British, Dutch, French, campaigns in Italy, Germany, Africa, Asia, and the New World, and helped them overcome the Ottomans. Potosi is such a fascinating example of human nature in an extreme environment. The setting has all the hallmarks of a Hollywood blockbuster or an epic HBO series. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I did making it and researching this topic. I also have some of the sources in the description. If you would like to see more videos like this, help me out and hit that like button, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and every time I make a new video, you'll get a notification. If you would like to be a top supporter of this channel, like Alberto Balaz, Jody, Ivan, and Morpheus, head over to Patreon, and for just $3 a month, you can have your name in all my future videos. Thank you so much, damas y caballeros, and until next time, this has been Epimetheus.